are these people? Consortium News is writing a book about the reporting on the Assange case. And it's not just about the four okay. years, but actually about the 14 years. Because they have it documented yeah. that, like, from 2010, who was the founder of Consortium News in 1995, all right, Robert Parry yeah. wrote a piece called Journalists Are All Julian Assange. All right, and this was, mm -hmm. was way ahead of the story. Quote, whatever the unusual aspects of the case, the Obama administration's reported plan to indict WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange for conspiring with Army Private at that time, Bradley Manning, now Chelsea, to obtain U.S. secrets, strikes at the heart of investigative journalism on national security scandals. Right? I saw they did a consortium, did a great thing on David McBride today. People should go check that out. They did, for sure. You know? Yep. Consortium was yep. there every step of the way during his four-year legal battle to avoid extradition. All right. They were either physically inside the courtroom in London or viewed every minute of his hearings via video link, produced breaking news, groundbreaking analysis in print, and on CN Live, CN won a prize for its Assange reporting. That's the Julian Assange Award. Um, also, not just yeah. for that reporting, but for all of its reporting, they are in, of course, Indie Media Award honoree. Inaugural Class 22. Um, yeah. The book will provide an overarching, both an overarching and a detailed history of the political and legal aspects of his long struggle against a repressive state trying to silence him. It will be called The Julian Assange Case as reported by Consortium News. Very on the nose title. <laughs> you know? Yep. Not subtle by any means, but happy that Kathy and Joe Loria and Elizabeth are all coming together to put this together. Uh, that's really cool. Um, but not only that, we got more news this week about Julian. And I hope you all are ready Tuesday morning. Because Julian Assange to address Council of Europe following confirmation of his, of his status as a political prisoner. This is a WikiLeaks William press. That fucked up the uh, Dick, Icky Leaks. Dicky Leaks. Licky, Licky Leaks. That's right. Uh, <laughs> right? So this, this was uh, announced on, I think, Tuesday morning that a week from then he will be in Strasbourg, France, to give evidence before the Committee on Legal Affairs and Human Rights of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe which is scheduled to meet at 8.30 a.m. to 10 a.m. at the Palace of Europe. So that's like going to be 3.30 in the morning, you know, New York City time-ish. This comes following the release of the Pace Inquiry Report into the Assange case, authored by Rapporteur. I'm not even going to bother trying to go after that one. Um... The report focuses on the implications of his detention and its broader effects on human rights, in particular, freedom of journalism. The report confirms that Assange qualifies as a political prisoner and calls on the UK, condu uh, on the UK to conduct an independent review into whether he was exposed to inhuman or degrading treatment, which we all know he was. So, Suna Eva's daughter... Uh, that's that's the investigator serves as the general rapporteur for political prisoners and is the chair of the subcommittee on artificial intelligence and human rights within Pace's legal affairs committee. She emphasizes how Assange's case is a high profile example of transnational repression. Yes. Yes, countries reach overreaching and trying to exert legal authority into other countries. Correct. Uh, the report discusses how to be confused with the other type of trans. No, 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 that's not, a bit different. <laughs> that, that's not that's not transnational like all or that's not trans. <laughs> OK, <laughs> that's yeah. that's fake, yeah. fake racial, <laughs> fake racial, transracial. Yes. All right. Exactly. Um, but, Transnational. That's when Australia suddenly wants to be China or something. Right? Uh, Hey, <sighs> not that there's anything wrong with that. Um, the, right. report, the report discusses 
how governments employ transnational, uh, how employ, they employ both legal and extra legal measures to suppress dissent across borders, which poses significant threats to press freedom and, and human rights. They also don't, they also look the other way as Israel bombs journalists' houses and destroys their families. Yeah. That's another story for another day. Continuing with the WikiLeaks post, Julian Assange is still in recovery following his release from prison in June 2024. He is attending this session in person due to the exceptional nature of the invitation and to embrace and support the and and embrace the support received from Pace and its delegates over the past years. It's nice that he's saying thank you to somebody by doing something. That's great. It's a good start. I can't wait to hear the rest. I'm so excited. Yep. Like jumping through my shoes. Pace has a mandate to safeguard human rights and has repeatedly called for Assange's release when he was in prison, as have we all. He will give testimony before the committee, which will also hear the findings that his imprisonment was politically motivated. Again, no surprise there. The hearing marks Assange's first official testimony on his case since before his imprisonment in 2019. His appearance before Europe's foremost human rights and treaty-setting body emphasizes the broader implications of his case. I, I would say so. Um, Stella says that, you know, that Julian will be in Strasbourg and it will be an exceptional break from his recovery as they invited him to provide testimony. When Stefania too says, it's so good news, such good news to see him, to that we're going to see him. I think he, she might even travel to Strasbourg to meet him in person. She wrote a tweet about something about seeing him in person for the first time since 2010. And I'm like, if so, please give him a hug for all of us, like, for real. It's so cool mm -hmm. that, like, we have access to be able to, to talk to somebody like her. Just, wow. All right. Um, read Julian Assange. Freed Julian Assange. Um, you know, there were there have been a couple of celebratory kind of Things. There was one in New York City, a bunch of activists got together. I heard about another one recently. I think it might have been in Sydney. And and that's that's great. You know, all the activists, you know, I know Misty did a show to celebrate the people who brought all that together. And uh and again, very cool. And I I cannot wait to hear what he's gonna have to say. And whew, that's that's gonna be emotional just uh, just to see him. Uh, all right. Yep. <clears throat> anything Anything else you have to add to that one? Because I know you've followed quite a bit. No. No. Not really. I mean, I, it's definitely... I'd be worried about going to France if I were him. Like, I would not want to leave the country that he's in right now. But that's well, just me. That's, that's what um, Cynic is saying. I would be so nervous if I was Julian or going to France or, well, anywhere. Yeah. I couldn't stop looking over my shoulder, and I kind of agree with you there, um, of course. And especially because <clears throat> I think that they might have told him to really just disappear forever, and if he's not planning on doing that, wow. That's, that's what we were expecting from him, honestly. So... Yep. It's good. It's good to see. This is a short, short article. I pulled snippets of. The link will be in the description and the Substack afterwards. But I thought again a very important article that it was worthy of bringing tonight because this is a woman, and it's not just her, who is talking about the cost of childcare and not just the short term expense but the long-term cost on a family and on a childhood and on raising that child and as well as on the parent. All right. Um, I thought this was a really important story. And Colin also, when I showed it to him, he's like, um, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Every time I was reading a sentence, he just, I was like, yeah, I, I guess I need to bring this one. So, uh, Eletha Jones uh, on In Other Words magazine, which is a, a lefty publication, says my family is still financially recovering from the birth of my daughter 14 years ago. Child care and paid leave should be election issues, but somehow they never are. I mean, I remember we got 
the the family leave the paid family leave act right uh that was 1996 yeah. i believe with bill clinton that's right. like the, meanwhile fla other countries mm, F, fmla family two years leave. paid lame paid right. family leave plus paternity leave plus 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 you know like paid god forbid right so like so she writes that according to the nonprofit Child Care Aware, the average cost of child care in the U.S. is now more than $10,000 per year. That's after-tax money. And even higher for infants and toddlers. And the problem is only getting yeah. worse. It's no wonder so many women are choosing not to have children because they say they can't afford them. The situation, and there's a lot more there, and I just kind of skipped through, and I said that their situation in one case became a catch-22 that if she didn't work, it would be impossible to balance their bills and afford the essentials to raise a child. Right. But if she did work, right, she wouldn't be able to afford those things anyway, all right, because all the money would be going to daycare. Paid leave can help address those mental stressors. Okay, According to one study, women who took longer than 12 weeks maternity leave reported fewer depressive symptoms, a reduction in severe depression, and an improvement in their overall mental health, which I know this woman I'm sure would have benefited from, and a lot of people would too. 12 weeks is nothing. I mean, to have to hand off your infant to a daycare center, that's, I mean, yeah. right, you said a year. I mean, they should have the flexibility at least, you know, for, yeah. But, this was a really, uh, you know, like a heartbreaker of an of an article. I didn't want to bring too much too much of it, but definitely go check this one out. I will I will link you to, to all of that in in other words. But I had some other important stories. And this one specifically got to me, which was about fluoride. And safe and effective. We've been hearing about fluoride in the water. And the reason that it's safe and effective, and that's why they've been putting fluoride in the water, because it's good for our teeth. Yeah. Right? Well, turns out, yeah, not so much. Well, at least in the opinion of one federal court judge in this lawsuit, written, and so Derek Bros, who is a member of the Indi Independent Media Alliance that's just formed, um, he's from the, the Last American Vagabond. His channel is The Conscious Resistance, so give him a follow. Uh, I've got another thing of his later. He was also censored um, off of YouTube and stopped trying to get into England because he refused to do facial recognition. Derek's an interesting cat. But again, I just grabbed a couple of paragraphs from this article that a federal judge has ruled that fluoride is a neurotoxin in a historic lawsuit ruling. So... Mm. On Tuesday, a federal court in California found that fluoridation of water at 0.7 milligrams per liter poses an unreasonable risk of reduced IQ in children. What? Yep. The new ruling issued by Judge Edward Chen noted that the finding does not conclude with certainty that fluoridated water is injurious to public health, but he does find that there is an unreasonable risk of such injury. Mm. Okay, so this risk is sufficient to require the EPA to enact a regulatory response. And that's what the ruling uh, was about. They are not necessarily saying that, it's a, that it is. It needs to be investigated and something needs to be done about it, but they can't do nothing. <laughs> While he doesn't tell the EPA what the response to the ruling should be, he said they can't ignore the risk. So the EPA must now initiate a rulemaking process to determine what regulation they'll implement in order to lower or eliminate the risk posed by water fluoridation. I remember we covered an article here three years ago from Erin Brockovich about fluoride being bad and the mass fluoridation because people were being poisoned in some cases and getting way too much fluoride if they were drinking the standard amount of water that you were supposed to drink. Right. Okay. Um, Derek writes, the EPA is likely mm -hmm. to appeal the decision, but 
could also drag out the rulemaking process for years. So we're probably not going to get this addressed, but just be careful when it comes to drinking fluoridated water. The Fluoride Action Network believes that the most effective way to eliminate this risk is to end water fluoridation and ban the practice altogether. I mean, they, they still put fluoride in your toothpaste, right? They put fluoride in... They give you a treatment when yeah. you go to the dentist. They gave my kid a fluoride treatment like this week or last week, and I was like, they maybe signed something, a waiver about it. I was like, right. I was really nervous to do that. Um, damn. Yeah. All right. Well, this is why you don't drink any water and only drink Dunkin' Donuts trademarked hummingbird fuel. Yeah, and where do but... you think? And what do you think? Bruise that. <laughs> <laughs> like that that's definitely the healthiest option, I'm sure. You know? So so continuing with Derek, I grabbed two more slides. And again, there's a lot more to this article, so please go check it out. It's really important. But that the ruling comes on the heels of the of the release of the of a long delayed and censored report from the US National Toxicology Program. No, no big deal, right? No reason to censor mm. that. The NTP found moderate confidence that fluoride exposure is consistently associated with lower IQ in children. We're literally yep. dumbing down our kids. Well, I mean, <laughs> you know, Disney's doing that enough, so. But what? My kids know every Mickey, word. don't come for me. My kids know every word to those damn descendant songs. Oh my god, it's oh it's terrible. All right. The you don't talk about it. The NTP is run by the US Department of Health and Human Services, HHS, to coordinate, evaluate, and report on toxicology within public agencies and is headquartered at the National Institute of Envir Environmental Health Sciences, right? That's I believe in DC. Um so that moderate confidence consistently associated with lower IQ in children. So we, you know, thank goodness. And I know Steve over at AM Wake Up had the, the guy who brought the lawsuit from Fluoride Action Network, Jim, somebody or other. He was on AM Wake Up this week. So check that out. I think it was Thursday. I caught that. All right, so this is the last quick hit that I had, um, and that that is that the the West Bank, while we're being distracted, quote unquote, but while Israel is dropping bombs everywhere, they're also bulldozing streets in the West Bank. So yeah. I brought this one from um, <laughs> Common Dreams Indie Media Award honoree. Hamas, Hamas is under the streets, Indy. Well, th anyway, that's the, the <laughs> secret tunnels. I mean, come on. Uh. No, the idea behind it is that, look, one local leader says we watch their bulldozers tear up streets, demolish businesses, pharmacies, schools. They even bulldoze the town's mm -hmm. soccer field and a tree in the middle of the road. Like, uh, oh. <laughs> Nope. So she World starts that, So she writes that while nearly nightly raids by the IDF have become the norm in the West Bank since the Hamas led October 7th attack, although she didn't really realize, write that Hamas doesn't operate in the West Bank and there's no reason for them to be there, the military last month launched well, one of its most extensive and deadliest raids in the illegally occupied Palestinian territory in years. Okay, we watch their bulldozers tear up streets, demolish businesses, pharmacy schools. They even bulldoze the soccer field, free in the middle of the road. What's the point of all this? The governor of Janine. In addition to ground operations in the West Bank, the IDF has increased airstrikes. The critics say run afoul of international law. Nobody holds them to international law. Why wouldn't they? The military, yeah. de the military, of course, defended the strikes, because they always do, and told the Times that in recent raids, troops found weapon stockpiles and 
killed or arrested dozens of militants, but also caused some unavoidable harm to certain civilian structures. Just unavoidable. Uh huh. Uh huh. They can precision hit the third floor of an apartment building to murder a, a nurse and her t and her infant twins, but unavoidable civilian structures. Malini Ragnathan, Ragnathan, who's an associate professor at American University School of International Service, <laughs> said on social media that Israel's criminality knows no limits. IDF bulldozers have been obliterating the West Bank, even tearing up roundabouts. Why? Well, multiple reasons. Because they hate cul-de-sacs. Israeli force, of course. Cul-de-sacs are Hamas. Have, yes, every well, uh, homes are Hamas. Shops and roads, <laughs> along with internet, electricity is Hamas. Phone lines and water is, is Hamas in the room with you right now. Um, they might. They they <laughs> never aren't. They, they, you know they're ever present. Sewage lines are Hamas now, and the West Bank. Emergency crews have been uh -huh. unable to respond to hundreds of calls a day because they can't reach people in need. Hence why Israel is bulldozing the streets. They don't want the ambulances to be able to get to the injured. They don't want the, the, the relief crews and the repair crews to be able to get to the places to fix stuff. They're imposing conditions materially and psychologically that make people feel Gaza is coming to you. al Haq director Shawan Jarabin told the Times. There's a feeling among Palestinians among the West Bank that what's coming is... Very, very bad. That it will be a plan to kill and expel us. And that's... Been that. Nobody's... Always nobody, has been. Nobody's stopping them. Nobody's, yep. nobody's stopping them. And we talked about that. We brought Kareem's article last week. I really got... I really... You know, I got a lot out of Kareem's article about, you know, how just brutal and barbaric. And then we saw the picture of Netanyahu and ordering the the bombing in, in Lebanon from the hotel room. Like, wow. Um, yeah. Well, reporting on stuff is like that is why we are censored and demonetized on YouTube. Although my channel on Indy, Le Indy at INN is actually still monetized. You could drop a super chat there. I would prefer it. The most optimal way to do it is, Money, via, is via that cash app, that first link there or via ko-fi.com slash Indie News Network, I-N-D-I-E. All those are also in the scrolling ticker at the bottom. They're in the description. Anyway, you can do that. We really appreciate it. Even that QR code up there. My we got apologies. A, we got a nice hookup from Carnival Hill to the PayPal this week. Um, we also got a re-sign up from James Arkazuski over on the Substack. So thank you so much. Um, really appreciate all the support. We need it all. Every dollar counts.